today we're looking at what is probably my favourite subject, um, which is reproduction and fertility. Um, this is something I get very excited about um, to the detriment of many conversations I have when I hijack it. So um, yeah, um, like I said at the beginning, um, do log on to the Socrative room. There'll be questions throughout just to test your knowledge and so that you can kind of gauge how you're doing. Um, these are the learning objectives that we're going to cover today. Um, basically the Oxford syllabus. Um, so it's split roughly into four sections. So fertilization and implantation, pregnancy and the placenta, birth and lactation, and infertility and contraception. Um, so I think it fits quite a, a neat timeline really, um, down through fertilization to birth and then kind of what happens if it doesn't all go to plan um, or you don't want a pregnancy. So yeah, we're gonna start off with fertilization and implantation, uh, which is the logical place to start. So also, um, if you have any questions, I will be watching the chat. So do just message into the chat. And equally, my main feedback from last week is going too quickly. So if I'm going too quickly, please do put it into the chat because I do cook quite quickly. And there's also quite a lot to get through this evening. Um, but I'm so happy to go back over things. So do just let me know um, just by putting a message in um, or putting your hand up or unmuting yourself and we can take the pace a bit slower. So first step I would say is ovulation. So on day 14 of the menstrual cycle you get high LH and estrogen levels um, which cause release of an oocyte and the surrounding granulosa cells um, which is known as the cumulus matrix into the peritoneal cavity. So from the ovaries into the peritoneal cavity and then here it's then picked up um, by the fimbriae of the fallopian tubes which you can just see on the, sl the slide here um, and then the cilia in the fallopian tubes waft it down um, further down the ampulla into the isthmus. Now you obviously only get pregnancy is if ovulation kind of coincides with sexual intercourse. So it, it doesn't have to be exactly on the day. Um, so sperm can live in the female reproductive tract for up to five days. So sex anytime up to five days before ovulation can result in fertilization but the egg only survives 24 hours um, in the female reproductive tract once it's been released. Um, so you've kind of got that time window um, in which um, fertilization needs to occur. Um, there are three main phases um, to the male sexual act. Um, and it's quite, they often like asking this question because it's all different parts of the nervous system. Um, so point and shoot is the way I was taught. Um, so erection point um, is due to arteriolar vasodilation. Um, and that's the parasympathetic nervous system. So P, um, emission shoot um, movement of the ejaculate into the prostatic urethra which is the sympathetic, so S, um, and then ejaculation um, is movement from the prostatic urethra out of the penis, um, and that's under somatic nervous control by the pudendal nerve. With each ejaculation, about 200 million sperm are released into the female reproductive tract, and from ejaculation, they probably take about five minutes or so to reach the egg, um, which is aided by contraction of the uterus and of the fallopian tubes. Um, but less than 100 of these sperm will actually reach the ampulla of the fallopian tubes. Um, many don't have the correct modifications, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, sometimes the female immune system will engulf them or they just go the wrong way. Um, so, yeah, very few sperm actually reach where they're needed to be um, for fertilisation. So once sperm are in the female reproductive tract, they undergo an important set of changes known as capacitation. So it's kind of got a weird definition, but capacitation is essentially any changes required for the sperm to be able to fertilize the egg. So this is a variety of things. So sperm have hyperactivated motility, um, which means their tails take on a kind of whiplash like motion um, and they lose some cholesterol from their membrane heads. And there's a series of biochemical reactions happening inside them. And essentially at the end of capacitation, what you get is the acrosome reaction. So this is because the egg has an outer covering called the zona pellicida, and this is made of glycoproteins. And so in order for the sperm to reach the egg, it needs to break down this zona pellicida. So the sperm has this acrosome, which contains hydrolytic enzymes, 
And so when sperm receptors bind to ZP3 on the oocyte, the membranes of the acrosome and the sperm fuse. So the acrosome enzymes are released to the outside and these are hydrolytic, so they break down the zona pellucida. Once this breakdown has happened, the sperm is able to penetrate the zona and the membranes of the sperm and the oocyte fuse. The contents of the sperm enters the egg and one of the really important contents is the enzyme PLC Zeta, um, which again, if you take the reproductive option next year, you will hear no end about. Um, and so this is a phospholipase C, as it sounds though, it's phospholipase C Zeta, um, that induces calcium waves to occur in the egg. Like most incidences in biology, these calcium waves set off a chain of reactions. So one of the first ones of these is known as the cortical reaction. So there are a series of granules just under the membrane of the oocyte. And when the calcium waves start, these granules fuse and cross-link the zona pellucida. And this prevents any sperm penetrating, um, any more sperm. So it's known sometimes as the block to polyspermy, um, because obviously you only want one sperm and one set of genetic material per oocyte. Once the cortical granule reaction has happened, um, you get meiosis resuming in the egg. So until now, the oocyte has been arrested in metaphase of meiosis 2. But when you get these sequential calcium waves, what happens is meiosis resumes, you get formation of the second polar body, and then the pronuclei from the sperm and the egg are able to fuse and form the zygote, which is the new cell. So that's fertilization. Um, it normally happens around the ampulla of the fallopian tubes. Um, and of course it doesn't stay there. Um, through sequential days, um, the zygote moves down and it undergoes a set of cleavages. It probably remains in the fallopian tube for about 72 hours, um, where it eventually develops into the marula, um, which you can see around day three to four, um, and you've got a comp uncompacted and a compacted marula. And then it begins to move into the uterine cavity, where after six to seven days or so, or just slightly later, um, it implants itself in the endometrium. So in order to think about implantation, it's important to think about what the endometrium is like around the time that implantation would happen. So we're about seven days after ovulation, because um, like we said, ovulation, and then you've got seven days for it to travel down the fallopian tubes and into the uterus. And we've got the secretory phase um, of the endometrial cycle because high progesterone levels stimulate uterine gland secretion. So this provides a nutrient rich environment which facilitates implantation of the blastocyst. The progesterone produced um, is from the corpus luteum, which you can just see over the top um, in the column labelled follicular development. Um, and this is just the remainder of the follicle that the egg released to ovulation um, came from. In a usual menstrual cycle, um, this corpus luteum would eventually break down, um, which induces a drop in progesterone. And so that's why um, you get menstruation and the lining breaks away. But what happens is that once the blastocyst is implanted, it secretes HGG, um, HCG being the hormone that pregnancy tests pick up. And this maintains the corpus luteum. So progesterone secretion is continued, um, which maintains the lining. So the blastocyst is able to implant until eventually later on in pregnancy, the placenta produces enough progesterone that HCG levels can drop and the corpus luteum isn't needed. But this leaves quite a short implantation window um, because obviously you want to you want implantation to occur while the corpus luteum is still present. So you're seven days post ovulation already and you want to be before the kind of 24, 25 days when the um, corpus luteum starts to break down. So that's quite a narrow window. Um, so when you think about the number of sperm reaching the uterine cavity and reaching the fallopian tubes, when you think about implantation happening at the right moment, um, when people say babies are miracles, in many ways they really are because there are actually a lot of blockages um, that could happen before pregnancy is established, um, which is defined as the implantation into the endometrium. So this is looking at actual implantations. We've talked about kind of 
what's needed for implantation. Um, actual implantation is the action of the trophoblast cells, which you can see around the outside of the blastocyst here. At this stage, the blastocyst is made of an inner cell mass, which will eventually form the embryo, um, and the outer layer of trophoblast cells. So these first adhere to the wall of the uterus, and then they penetrate the epithelium and trigger what's called the decidual reaction. The decidual reaction involves the uterine stroma becoming enlarged and filled with glycogen, um, and this is what nourishes the blastocyst until the placenta is able to form. Whilst implantation most commonly occurs on the upper posterior part of the uterus, um, this isn't always the case. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of an ectopic pregnancy, um, which is a condition where the blastocyst out attaches outside the main body of the uterus um, and most commonly attaches in the fallopian tubes. And because as you think, it has to travel down the fallopian tubes. And if it doesn't get that far, it can often implant early. This is relatively common, occurring in one in 80 pregnancies. And it's a medical emergency because you can get rupture of an ectopic pregnancy and life threatening hemorrhage which means that if you as clinicians ever have a woman presenting to A&E with abdominal pain, the first thing you do is a pregnancy test um, to rule out an ectopic pregnancy. So we've got a blastocyst in place and pregnancy established. Um, so we're gonna talk about pregnancy in a second, but if you wanna whip over to Socrative, we're just gonna go through the first couple of questions. Great, so about 50% of people have answered. So I'll give you a couple more seconds. If you want the name, if you missed what the name is, it's, I'll type it in the chat. Um, come on, everything's been very slow. It's Canso 6760. And let's have a look, show results. Perfect, 100% there. Right, the next part. Where does fertilization most commonly occur? Two more seconds. Brilliant. So Fertilization is in the fallopian tubes and implantation is in the uterus. If implantation happens in the fallopian tubes, it's an ectopic pregnancy and very, very rarely will um, fertilization happen in the uterus. Um, it is definitely most commonly in the fallopian tubes. The corpus luteum is a source of HCG. Let's have a look. False. OK, perfect. Most of you got it right. So for those of you who put true, what happens is the corpus luteum produces progesterone and normally it's LH um, that induces this um, that continues the progesterone secretion from the corpus luteum. Um, but what happens in, um, in the ovulation cycle is that you get a reduction towards the end of the endometrial phase and you need something else to stimulate um, the, the production of progesterone by the corpus luteum. Um, and so that's where HCG comes in and it stimulates progesterone production to maintain the corpus luteum. Um, it maintains progesterone production from the corpus luteum until the placenta can eventually produce progesterone for itself. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, let me know if it doesn't. And I think, oh yes, final question, which tissue goes on to form the placenta? Um, which we'll answer now, but we're actually going to come on to a little bit more in the second bit. So don't worry if you don't know this one yet, because um, this is what we're about to move on to. Trophoblast. Perfect. So yeah, the trophoblast tissue is what goes on to, talk, to form the placenta. So we've got to implantation. Um, oh, got someone typing. I oh, just say it because it's quicker. Uh, you know, for the menstrual cycle diagram, I was yeah. a little bit confused. Does fertilization have to take place on day zero then? No. Okay. So, Fertilization has to take place around days 
well, it have, has to happen just after ovulation um, because okay. the egg only lives for about 24 hours once it's been released. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. No I didn't see the top. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So pregnancy. We normally talk about pregnancy lasting about 40 weeks, um, but that's how doctors measure pregnancy because um, they ask for the last menstrual period. In reality, it's actually 38 weeks from fertilisation to delivery. And to understand a lot of changes that are undergone in pregnancy, we're going to first talk about the organ of pregnancy, um, which is the placenta. So the placenta, as we've just learned, forms from the trophoblast cells of the blastocyst, um, the ones that originally invaded the endometrium. Um, and as we've said, it's normally formed on the upper posterior wall of the uterus. So I always found placental formation quite confusing. Um, I think there are lots of different things um, that yeah are confusing about it um there are different layers of trophoblasts and things like that so i've kind of broken it down into four stages here so first what happens is the outer layer of the trophoblast so the syncytiotrophoblast invades the endometrium so the maternal uterus lining and forms primitive villi and then what happens is the spiral arteries erode and form intervillous blood spaces so the syncytiotrophoblasts have a maternal blood supply and then you get primary villi forming because the cytotrophoblasts, so the inner layer of the trophoblasts, proliferate and invade the villi, which you can see in the left hand diagram. And then the secondary villi form um, as extra embryonic mesoderm forms, around, forms a little core in the middle of the villi. And then finally, you get tertiary villi forming um, because you get invasion of fetal blood vessels. Um, so obviously during pregnancy, the placenta has to grow because the fetus grows. Um, are primitive villi the same as anchoring villi? Ooh, good question. Um, I haven't actually come across anchoring villi in any of the reading I've done. So I would say go back and look and see if they sound the same. Um, I will look it up for you afterwards and let you know later or while we're doing the next operative question. Um, but I think part of the reason I, I found this topic quite confusing is because there's a lot of different terminology. Um, so sorry not to be able to answer you straight away, but um, I will have a look and get back to you, Leah. Um, I imagine they're the same because they're kind of anchoring to me sounds like the first ones to form. Um, so I'd say that probably sounds like primitive, um, but I will look it up and get back to you. Um, no worries. Um, so yeah, as, as the fetus grows, the placenta has to grow because obviously um, you need increased transmission of nutrients. But eventually fetal growth outpaces placental growth. And so instead the placenta has to increase efficacy of transfer and efficiency. So it does this by increasing the branching of the villi to form a brush border, similar to the ones that you see in the small intestine. Um, and this increases the surface area for exchange. And obviously one issue with this is that pregnancies that go past term risk placental insufficiency because the fetus has grown so much and the function of the placenta falls just slightly before term. Um, and this might be what triggers labour, the falling function of the placenta, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but it's one of the reasons that women are often induced if they go a certain time past their due date um, because they worry about transport across the placenta. So, like I said, the placenta, its main function um, is for transport. And so this is a kind of macro image of what happens with that. Um, so you can see just at the bottom of the image, the umbilical cord um, and the deoxygenated fetal arteries coming across. Um, they then form villi in the placenta um, and then the maternal vessels provide oxygen. Um, and then the oxygenated fetal veins go back and through the umbilical cord. So like we said, the main function of the placenta is um, for exchange of substances between the placenta and the fetus. And there are different methods of this depending on what type um, the substance is. So small non-polar molecules can move just by simple diffusion. Um, so oxygen diffuses across the placenta via a pressure gradient from a mother to fetus. Um, and I actually think oxygen transfer is quite cool from mother to fetus um, because 
um, fetuses have fetal haemoglobin, um, which is specifically adapted for the transfer of oxygen because it's both got a higher affinity than normal haemoglobin for oxygen. So the curve is left shifted, um, if you think of the, the haemoglobin and the, the oxygen concentration curve. Um, and it's also found at higher concentrations, so there's a greater concentration of haemoglobin in the blood than is normally found in adults. Um, carbon dioxide, of course, is transported in the opposite direction since it's a waste from the fetus. Obviously, you've then got your nutrients, so glucose and amino acids. Um, amino acids are actively transported because of, they're particularly important um, for the creation of proteins for fetal growth. And wastes need to move across because the fetal liver is immature and not able to process things like urea and bilirubin. So these pass into the maternal circulation. So that's the main function of the placenta as an exchange surface, um, but it's also an endocrine organ. It produces a lot of hormones that are responsible for the changes both in the mother and the fetus throughout pregnancy. And there are two different types of hormones. So the placenta produces peptide hormones. So the main ones of these are HCG and HCS. So HCG, human chorionic gonadotrophin hormone, um, like we said earlier, is the one produced by the trophoblast cells and maintains the corpus luteum at the start of pregnancy. Um, and so since it's important at the start of pregnancy, it rises early and then decreases slightly as term goes on. And then HCS is human chorionic somatomammotrophin, which is quite a mouthful. Um, and as its name suggests, mammotrophin, it's important for the development of breasts and, lac breasts and lactation. Um, but maybe more importantly than this, it has a lot of effects on maternal metabolism. So in the mother, HCS decreases insulin sensitivity and decreases glucose usage whilst promoting the release of free fatty acids from maternal stores. So the net effect of all this, so a reduction in insulin sensitivity and decreased glucose usage, is more glucose is available for the fetus. Um, so there's higher concentrations of um, fetal glucose and that obviously um, helps with growth and development. The other type of hormones that the placenta produces other than um, peptide hormones are steroid hormones. So it produces both progesterone and estrogen. And as you can see, is this the cause of gestational diabetes? Ooh, um, as in HCS. Um, I think it is part of the mechanism of gestational diabetes. Um, I can't say I've looked into it. Ooh, insulin sensitivity. Yeah, I can't say I've looked into it that closely, but definitely delivery often results in complete reversal of gestational diabetes. So I imagine it's some of the mechanism. Um, but again, very happy to go and look at that and get back to you. Um, I know someone, a couple of people who did third year projects on um, gestational diabetes. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll have a look for you. Um, but I, yeah, I imagine that's some of the reason. There are definitely a lot of metabolic changes that go on during pregnancy that are reversed by delivery of the placenta um, and insulin insensitivity is one of them. Um, yeah, hope that answers. Again, a bit of a wishy-washy answer, but um, I'd, I'd say fairly sure, but probably not the whole mechanism, like with most things in biology. Great, so HCS, insulin and sensitivity, hormonal changes, prioritising um, glucose for the fetus, and then progesterone. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, oestrogen and progesterone, the ratio of the two changes um, over the duration of pregnancy. And this is something important that we'll come back to when we talk about birth. So progesterone is originally produced by the corpus luteum, like we've been saying, um, but throughout pregnancy, um, the placenta produces increasing amounts as well as the development of the deciduous cells in the endometrium, so those cells that are important for implantation. Um, progesterone reduces uterine contractility, which obviously is a good thing because you don't want a contracting uterus at 20 weeks, um, and also aids with development of the breast alveoli. The other steroid hormone is estrogen or the estrogens, because there's more than one. Um, and these cause growth of the uterus to accommodate the growth of the baby. They relax the pelvic ligaments, which are important for the passage of baby at birth. And they're responsible for the growth of the breast ducts. 
So it's important to say that the, project, the placenta alone doesn't produce oestrogen. Um, so like I said, there's not just one oestrogen, there are three different types. So oestradiol, oestrone and oestriol. So oestradiol is the most, um, the strongest, most potent one, um, though I don't think you're really going to be asked for the difference between the three. Um, so it, this is where the, the idea of the feto maternal placenta fetal unit, I don't think there's a right way to put those three, um, comes into play. So the placenta has the enzymes in which to produce these estrogens, but it doesn't have the precursors. So what you get is the maternal and fetal adrenal glands producing dihydroepiandrosterone, um, or more easily DHEAS, -E uh, which is a weak androgen then converted to um, estrogen in the placenta. And yeah, just while we're on the subject of steroid hormones and the placenta, and if you were here last week, I think I waxed lyrical about this, um, because another important steroid hormone is cortisol. Um, and in the placenta, it's important because cortisol has impacts on placental metabolism. So the fetal programming of um, adult disease hypothesis was first proposed by David Barker um, in the 1970s, to give you a bit of a history lesson, um, who observed that if fetuses in utero were malnourished, um, they then had a greater risk of obesity and cardiovascular disease later in life. And I think this is because malnutrition increases the level of cortisol in the body of the mother um, and causes the stress response. So you get more levels of cortisol transported across the placenta to the fetus. And not only this, but cortisol itself affects the functioning of the placenta because the placenta has an enzyme um, known as 11 beta HSD2 um, that's responsible for metabolizing cortisol and present, preventing its transfer, transfer to the fetus. But actually, when there's so much cortisol release, this enzyme is uh, overwhelmed and cortisol itself can affect how this enzyme functions to reduce the barrier to cortisol. So you get this kind of more cortisol, less barrier to transport, more cortisol across, less um, metabolism of cortisol. And we also know that cortisol is crucial for prenatal development um, because we give it to preterm infants to speed up lung maturation. But too much cortisol at the wrong time can result in reprogramming of the HPA axis. And as we saw last week with the hypothalamus, um, alterations in the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis can lead to diseases like obesity, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, depression. So in some ways, it's important to know whether giving preterm infants cortisol is going to put them at greater risk of later life disease. Um, and there are lots of studies going on into this at the moment. Um, and yeah, while we know it's really important for short term survival of the fetus um, and the infants when they're born, um, actually, it could be having really deleterious effects in later life that we need to understand um, as we're giving these drugs, and as we're consenting mothers um, to having them. So that's one thing that can go wrong, um, too much stress. Obviously, there are things that can go wrong with the placenta itself in the short term. So a common condition is preeclampsia, um, which occurs in 3% of pregnancies. So this is a triad of hypertension, proteinuria, so protein in the urine, and edema. Left untreated, preeclampsia develops to eclampsia, um, which is where women have seizures and they often die. And it's one of the leading cause of maternal mortality across much of the world. So women with preeclampsia are closely monitored and often delivered early because delivery of the placenta completely reverses this hypertension proteinuria edema. And I think the placenta is involved um, because the condition is more common in twin pregnancies or in molar pregnancies, um, a molar pregnancy being where there's lots and lots of trophoblast tissue and you don't get formation of the fetus in quite, in, or the blastocyst itself in quite the right way. Um, and the current hypothesis is that the trophoblast cells, so when the placenta is forming, don't properly invade the spiral arteries of the mother. And so you get reduced blood throw, flow through the placenta. So the placenta is insufficient to provide the fetus with nutrients. Um, so, yeah, that's a common condition that's worth knowing about because um, it's important that these women are monitored. 
And then you can get the opposite. So if preeclampsia is failure to invade properly, um, you can get an abnormally invasive placenta. And you don't need to know all these, um, but if you're interested, these are the different um, conditions you get when the placenta either attaches, attaches simply to the myometrium, so the muscle layer of the uterus, when it invades the myometrium, or when it invades the serosa. You can also get a cancer of placental origin, um, which is known as a choriocarcinoma. Um, and this is a rapidly spreading cancer, but treatable with chemotherapy. So these are the things that can go wrong with the placenta in the long term with cortisol transport, um, but in the short term with preeclampsia and abnormally invasive placentas. But as we sadly know, in lots of pregnancies, you can get abnormalities of the fetus. Um, and this occurs in about two to three percent of pregnancies in the UK. Prenatal testing can be used for making decisions regarding the pregnancy, um, such as whether to continue, as well as just preparing the parents for the circumstances of birth. And on the Oxford syllabus, you need to know some of the ways that we diagnose conditions in utero. So there are two invasive types, um, and this is chorionic villus sampling and amniocentesis. These sample either the trophoblast cells or the amniotic fluid. The reason that amniocentesis is done slightly later is it takes slightly more time for sufficient am amniotic fluid to build up so that there's a reduced damage uh, risk to the placenta. Um, because both these conditions, because they're invasive, are associated with a 1% to 2% risk of miscarriage. At the moment, the main tests carried out for these are the trisomies, so Downs, Edwards and Patels. Um, but I think increasingly, as we see genetic screening increasing, we're going to see lots more conditions um, um, screened with these tests. The third one on this diagram are ultrasounds, and these are routinely offered to women in pregnancy with a very high uptake rate as opposed to CVS and amniocentesis because they're non-invasive. Um, but because they're only imaging, um, not genetic testing, they can't pick up genetic disease. Instead, you're looking for things um, that are more structural, so cleft lip, spina bifida, other congenital conditions. And the uptake of ultrasound is obviously greater because it's got a non-invasive risk. But recently, um, another non-invasive technique has been developed that allows for genetic testing as well. And this is known as cell-free DNA. So we've talked about the placenta being an exchange organ. And one thing that it can also exchange is a small amount of cell-free DNA from the fetus to the maternal circulation. And because of the rapid boom in genome sequencing we've seen recently, we're able to sequence the maternal blood. So just with a simple blood test, they're able to differentiate between maternal DNA and fetal DNA and test for all sorts of genetic conditions. And so this has got a potential for a really big rollout because it's done by a simple blood test. And yes, genetic um, sequencing is still expensive and slightly prohibited at the moment. But I think the technology is going to come down a lot in price. And it's the kind of thing that there's a lot of ethical questions about having a test that makes it more easy to screen for conditions that aren't necessarily life threatening, but may be seen as serious conditions and may be considering maybe grounds to consider a termination of pregnancy. So there's I had an ethics class this morning, actually, where we were talking about some of this. Um, I think it's a really interesting question to think about. Anyway, enough of the wishy-washy ethics. Um, before we talk about birth and lactation, um, which is the obvious next bit, um, we're just going to do a couple more operative questions. So if you want to head on over, and again, if you have any questions, do just pop them in the chat. I'm very happy to answer them, though again, you know, they might be slightly wishy-washy if I don't know the answer. So what is the steroid required? Oh uh, yeah, what steroid is required by the placenta for estrogen production? So this is the one with a long name that I wasn't very good at pronouncing. Yeah, you guys have got it. D-H-E-A-S. Well done. No one's gone for the full name, which, to be honest, I don't think I'd know either. Ah, uh, and this one, I, I hope I've not left the slide up. Name some methods of prenatal genetic diagnosis. <laughs> 
I suppose the other thing to mention, um, just while you type out some answers, um, and we'll look at slightly more towards the end of the lecture, um, is we're now doing increasingly um, pre-implantation diagnosis. Um, so you've probably come across it where cells are taken from the embryo in IVF before it's implanted. And from this, you can choose which embryos to implant. Um, and actually, my discussion in my ethics class this morning was, should we be allowing sex selection of these embryos since, you know, it's not terminating an established pregnancy, it's just choosing to implant, you know, an, an embryo of one sex over the other. Um, and what are the ethics of that? Um, I disagree quite vehemently, but um, if you want to talk more, feel free to message me. <laughs> Great. So don't answer that question yet. We're going to come on to it in a second. So parturition, birth. Um, so before we talk about how the baby is born, it's probably worth thinking about the timing of birth. As we've said, we think about pregnancy as lasting 40 weeks, um, but rarely, rarely, rarely are babies ever born on their due date. Um, it's well known. Um, the exact nature and trigger for birth isn't entirely known at the moment still, which I think is really interesting. Um, but what we are fairly sure on is that the fetus has a role in determining when it's born. As we've said, the fetus outgrows the placenta eventually, um, so that would be a stimulus for birth, obviously. Um, and talking about steroid hormones, there's an increase in fetal cortisol production um, just prior to birth. And we think these are just two of the factors that are important in determining when birth occurs. So birth itself, um, again, it comes back to hormones. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, it's really important to think about the ratio of oestrogen to progesterone. So if I can go back to the earlier slide, um, throughout most of the pregnancy, um, up until about 24 weeks or so, you've got more progesterone than oestrogen. Um, and as we've said, progesterone prevents uterine contractility. But what happens um, leading up to birth is you get less progesterone, relaxing the uterus, and more oestrogen, which increases the number of gap junctions in the uterus and increases ex excitability. Oestrogen also stimulates the production of the prostaglandins, which do exactly the same. Um, and in fact, when women go past term and need inducing, prostaglandin pessaries are often given to stimulate contractions. The other important hormone is one produced by the posterior pituitary gland, and that's oxytocin. And this is involved in the positive feedback loop. Um, so towards the end of the pregnancy, the baby's head starts to stretch on the cervix because obviously it twists so that it's head down. And this induces what's known as the Ferguson reflex. So stretching of the cervix induces oxytocin release, which stimulates uterine contractions, which further pushes the head of the baby down on the cervix, stretching it more, more oxytocin release. And you get this loop until eventually the baby is born. Oxytocin is involved in another positive feedback loop, um, which is lactation. So the milk ejection reflex occurs when the baby suckles. So suckling initially doesn't involve, um, doesn't result in milk release, um, but that's because suckling is needed to stimulate oxytocin secretion from the posterior pituitary again, which acts on the myoepithelial cells of the breast, so the muscle cells and ducts. And this moves milk from the alveoli to the ducts. And then the negative pressure of the suckling results in milk release to the baby. So oxytocin is released in, is involved in the release of milk from the breasts, um, but other hormones are important for breast development and for milk production. So pre-puberty, um, the breast is simply made of ducts without any of the alveoli that actually produce milk. At puberty, what happens is GnRH secretion, so gonadotropin releasing hormone, secretion begins and oestrogen and progesterone are produced. Progesterone stimulates formation of the alveoli, the cells that will produce the milk, and oestrogen stimulates the branching of the ducts that are there and further development of the ducts. At puberty, um, oestrogen and progesterone increase, stimulating um, at pregnancy, sorry, that was meant to say, uh, oestrogen and progesterone increase further, like we said, the placenta helps produce them, um, but you also get additional hormones, so HPL um, and prolactin, which ensure the breasts are ready for milk production and breastfeeding. HPL is human placental lactogen. Um, 
And whilst progesterone and estrogen are crucial for the development of breasts, they actually inhibit secretion of milk. So only a small amount of milk is secreted up until the baby's born. When the placenta is delivered, the inhibiting effects of estrogen and progesterone are removed and milk production begins properly. The first milk produced by the mother is known as colostrum, and this is different to the milk produced for the rest of breastfeeding because it's got a lot lower fat content, but higher titers of the antibody IgA, and this helps the neonatal immune system. And then, of course, prolactin is important in stimulating the secretion of milk um, and the same suckling stimulus that induces oxytocin release also induces prolactin release, um, which promotes breast milk production. Um, so oxytocin, before we move on to the last section, um, the Oxford syllabus talks about the role of oxytocin in sexual and reproductive behaviours, which I think is quite a vague thing um, because we don't exactly know exactly what oxytocin, how it works, what it's involved in. Um, we know that it's really important in pair bonding, sexual arousal, romantic bonds, trust, recognition, um, all of these things that have contributed to it being known as the cuddle hormone. You've probably, if you study at Oxford, have heard a lot about it in relation to prairie voles. Um, so yeah, prairie voles have um, a high density of oxytocin receptors in their um, reward system. So they are literally addicted to um, social bonding and social contact. Um, but lots of the studies done in humans use nasal oxytocin to measure effects. Um, but these are really problematic um, because we don't actually know how much of this oxytocin reaches the brain, whether it reaches the brain in high enough concentrations to have an effect. Um, so until then, we know a lot about its physiological effects. So we've talked about the Ferguson reflex and the milk ejection reflex. Um, but it's quite hard to say um, whether it's going to be important in conditions where there is a disrupted social bonding. So things like depression, anxiety and autism. Um, but no doubt it's going to be a big area of research in the coming years. So take a breath. We're going to move on to the final section, um, but if you want to go over to Socrative, we will go through um, a couple more questions and then we are nearly finished. Um, again, if you have any questions, just type them in the chat um, and I will look up at some point um, both anchoring villi and gestational diabetes courses. I'm quite intrigued as well. Great, I'll show the answers. False, yeah. So a rise in the progesterone to estrogen ratio. So progesterone is the one that um, relaxes the uterus. And obviously, as you get towards birth, you don't want relaxation, you want contraction of the uterus. Um, so you get more um, estrogen. Which hormone stimulates contraction of the myoepithelial cells? Yeah, oxytocin. So prolactin stimulates milk production, um, but just like oxytocin stimulates, think of oxytocin as stimulating contraction. So contraction of the uterus, contraction of the myoepithelial cells in the ducts. Um, prolactin is more on the production of milk itself. Great, and I think, very sure the next question. Yeah, don't answer that one yet. We're gonna move on. Um, so we've gone all the way through from fertilization, implantation, pregnancy, birth, lactation, um, and all of that seems fairly smooth. Um, but actually, we know as doctors that it's a lot more complex than that. Um, we're going to look just briefly now on the subject of infertility um, and on contraceptive methods. So what we do when we want a pregnancy, but it's not happening, um, and what we do to prevent unwanted pregnancies. So before we talk about infertility, it's quite useful to think about the HPG, the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. So the hypothalamus starts releasing pulses of gonadotrophin releasing hormone at puberty, and this stimulates secretion of LH and FSH from the anterior pituitary gland. These then act on the gonads in both male and female to cause sexual development and production of the sex steroids, um, so estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, which then has a negative feedback effect to reduce the secretion of the hypothalamic and pituitary hormones, except, as we know, at day 14 of the menstrual cycle, where there is a positive feedback loop from estrogen to result in an LH surge, which is what eventually triggers ovulation. <laughs> 
So when we think about infertility, it's useful to distinguish changes in this axis here, so the HPV axis, and how sperm or uh, ovulation may be affected, um, with those that affect the anatomy of the genital tract, with those iatrogenic changes, so those induced by medications or by doctors. So infertility is a big problem. About one in seven couples will have issues conceiving, and it's not just problems with women. In 40% of couples, actually, infertility disorders are found in both males and females. And in 25%, there is no identifiable reason, which you imagine for couples who are desperate to have a baby, this is really, really frustrating. So this table I've just created from the NICE website, um, it kind of lists the main disorders of infertility. The most common are ovulation disorders, um, and these are 25% of infertility cases. The most common of these is PCOS, so polycystic ovarian syndrome. We understand this condition far less than we need to, to be able to treat the many, many women that suffer with it. Um, but it's it's involved in a disruption in the HPG access, axis. Um, so like we said earlier, you'll get disrupted ovulation. Other ovulation disorders um, include ones that inhibit GNH, R, GnRH release. Um, so things like low BMI, which is part of the stress response, um, and Kalman syndrome, um, where the neurons that eventually produce GnRH fail to migrate um, during neuronal development. Or um, ovarian failure, uh, which is where follicles just stop forming. Um, there are obviously issues with sperm production as well. Um, so failure of the testes to descend, so cryptical cryptocordism, um, similar issues with the hypothalamus, you can get Kalman's in men as well, um, or trauma to the testes. You then got the structural defects, um, so things in the uterus, so if you've got a uterine fibroid um, that can impair implantation, um, or you can get obstruction to the vas deferens, so sperm can't come out, um, which again both of these can be used um, as methods of contraception um, as well as can be causes of infertility. And I think finally, it's important to note that a lot of drugs can impair fertility. The obvious ones are contraceptive drugs, because that's the aim. Um, but there are also things like diuretics, so spironolactone, and importantly, chemotherapy. And um, I was involved in my research project last year. There's a lot of research going on at the moment as to how to preserve fertility in teenage cancer patients, because obviously chemotherapy um, it targets rapidly growing cells. And so in men will target the sperm um, and in women will target those developing follicles and the kind of granulosa cells around them. Um, and because cancer survival rates are increasing, um, particularly in teenagers, we're seeing increasingly um, chemotherapy mediated infertility become a problem. Um, and so lots of people are trying to work out how to preserve fertility in young patients who have to undergo chemo or radio. So what do we do to treat infertility? Um, this is where art comes in. So assisted reproductive technologies, not my least favorite GCSE subject. Um, the main one you'll have heard of is IVF, um, classic in vitro fertilization, um, which brought about the first test tube baby in the 1980s. This process involves collecting sperm and eggs from a couple, mixing them in a test tube or Petri dish, um, and then implanting the embryos into the woman or into a surrogate at a later date. But this is by far from the only way of assisting fertility. So you can get IUI, um, intrauterine insemination, um, where sperm are directly injected into the female reproductive tract. And this is often used um, when there's a problem only with the sperm um, and donor sperm are being used. There's ICSI, um, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, um, which is often done alongside IVF. Um, and there's a picture of it in the bottom right corner. Um, so a micro pipette injects the sperm directly into the egg. Um, which overcomes male factor infertility. So if the sperm aren't able to swim or penetrate the zona properly, there are aids of, um, there are drugs that can be used. Um, so one that's used in PCOS is called clomifen, um, and this is used to stimulate ovulation. And obviously, since we talked about ovulatory disorders being such a big cause of infertility, actually, this is a really important drug um, for overcoming infertility in that case. <laughs> 
and obviously you've got surgery if there's a structural problem um, and in cases where couples aren't able to conceive via any of these techniques obviously surrogacy can be used either with donor gametes or parental gametes. So that's a lot on um, infertility and um, what we do to overcome that. But obviously you've got the opposite problem, um, particularly in people of our age, we are thinking about preventing pregnancy. In my mind, there are kind of three physiological categories of contraception. So the first and most commonly used are barrier ones. So condoms, male or female, internal or external, or the diaphragm. Pair typical use, these are less effective than other ways because many typical use is not a very safe use of a condom. Um, so they're normally about 80% effective in preventing pregnancy, um, but they are by far the best and probably only way to prevent against STIs. So they are really important. You've then got hormonal contraception. So going back to the HPG axis, um, ones that alter that. So in women, you've got the pill, so either progesterone only or combined progesterone and oestrogen. Um, and recently, importantly for patients, actually, there's been lots of advances in the ways in which the pill can be taken. Um, the standard one is one pill for 21 days and then a seven day break and withdrawal bleed. But you can take a pill with a shortened break or no breaks at all, which is really beneficial for women who don't enjoy having a withdrawal bleed. You can get an IUS, um, which is a coil, and this releases progesterone into the uterus and has less systemic side effects because the hormones only release directly into the uterus rather than into the it's a pill and into the systemic circulation. Um, or a copper IUD, which alters the cervical mucus um, to impl um, impair sperm passage and makes implantation more difficult. And, you know, as I said, I love talking about reproduction. One of the big bugbears is the issue of male contraception. Um, it's one of the big mysteries. So whilst female contraception has gone leaps and bounds since the introduction of the pill, male contraception has not changed. Um, condoms and vasectomy remain the two main ways of preventing pregnancy on a kind of male burden side. The male pill is an interesting one because the main way of reducing sperm production would be to inhibit testosterone. But this comes with really unpleasant side effects for men. Um, so muscle loss, fatigue, mood changes. Research is currently looking at giving synthetic testosterone along with progesterone, which would stop the testes producing testosterone. So via the progesterone and so stop normal sperm production, but keep the kind of systemic levels of testosterone normal in the blood. But at the moment, this isn't effective um, to prevent pregnancy. So there's still a lot of research going on to this area. Um, and you really hope in the next few years they might see some good results starting to come out. And then in the final column, you've got the permanent methods um, of sterilization of preventing pregnancy. So cutting, sealing or blocking off either the fallopian tubes or the vas deferens, which are usually only done if there's no doubt um, about having any children in the future. So these are what I think of as the physiological um, types of contraception, so barrier hormonal and sterilization. But actually thinking as doctors, there are two important categories, not three. Um, so I've taken this from the SexWise website and there are contraceptive methods that you don't have to think about. And there are ones that you do have to think about. Classically, those that you don't have to think about, so an injection or the implant or the sterilization methods or a coil, have a higher efficacy per use um, because obviously you don't have to think about them. And obviously people don't always think carefully about contraception when it comes to sex. Um, but really importantly, only condoms will prevent against STIs. So these still remain a really important form of contraception, even if per use they are not the most effective form. So that's the trip through fertility and contraception. Um, if you want to hop on over to Socrative, we have two questions left. Um, and if you do have any questions, um, we're going to finish in shortly in a couple of minutes. So do pop them in the chat. Um, or if you don't want to put them in the chat now, my email will be on the end of the slide. So do feel free to email me. So, oh yeah, this is an interesting question. Which contraceptive method is least effective per typical use? Um, 
right let's have a look yeah so it's actually the diaphragm um so if you can see the explanation there's a little um percentage i think i found it from nice again um but yeah obviously the contraceptive pill is fairly effective um less effective than the patch even though it's the same hormones um and then yeah the, the diaphragm is the least effective of those lot um so yeah it's worth it's quite an interesting read kind of having a look at per use um and the kind of theoretical perfect use um and thinking about actually as doctors how patients see a treatment um often you'll come across on a slight tangent next year you'll come across um different analyses in your research projects and in your reading um where drug trials will have been done per perfect use and per kind of normal user use um and the results are actually quite different for different treatments when they're doing them in clinical trials um because patients very rarely take things per perfect use. So final question, what is the most common cause of infertility? Let's have a look. Right. Perfect. Yeah. PCOS and ovulation disorders. Those are the most common causes of infertility. So thank you so much for listening to my rabble on um, reproduction. Um, do fill in the feedback form. Um, feedback is so, so useful um, for us and for thinking about next lectures that we do. Um, and yeah, um, you'll get the slides if you put that in as well. And I hope the slides will be useful. Um, yeah, I will hang on the call for another couple of minutes in case anyone has any questions. Um, but again, do feel free to email me if you do. Um, and if not, thank you so much for listening.